to the cloud. Perfect. Okay, yes, it's recording. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much everyone for being here. I see at the bottom that um, so far we have 70 participants, so that's quite a, that's quite a group. Um, I, the, the three presenters, well, actually it's turned into four presenters, so it's gonna be me, uh, Michelle Forstrom, my sister, Danielle Huff, and then my mom and dad, Tom and Julie Caswell. Um, I do also have a, a PowerPoint. Um, we'll see if that works out. If not, that's all right. Um, but I'm gonna try to share that right now here. Okay. Um, just one second here. And there we go. Oops, let me go back to the beginning here. Okay, so I wanted to start out by asking a few questions. And one of them, and, and just so everyone knows, this fireside is primarily for the Bulgaria Sofia missions that are the missionaries that are currently serving in Bulgaria right now. So um, when we do the q and I would really like um, for us to focus on them, but we can keep the chat box going, that's great. And um, yeah, we just wanted to share with them the, the history of the mission. So the three questions I wanna ask you is, does God know who I am? This is, these are questions I want you to think of as you're hearing this presentation. Does God know who I am? Does God have a plan for my life? And does God or my heavenly father have miracles in mind for me? And the first uh, story that is gonna be told is from my mother and that's, that's her on the far, far right. And this is a story that happened to her in kindergarten. So go ahead and take it away, mom. Let me see if I can stop screen share here. Okay, so Elder Hatch, how do I, mom, can you unmute yourself and go ahead and start with your first story? The how many of you believe in God story? Or do I unmute people? Okay, I do, okay. Okay, ah. Let me see if I can. Okay, there you go. Hey mom, go ahead and start over. Okay. I'm Sister Caswell. I was born and raised under communism. How many of you believe in God? Said my kindergarten teacher. I looked around and the 40, my four, uh, 40 uh, friends and students in my classroom, they were all showing by raising their hand that they believed in God. I slowly raised mine. I had been taught by my parents and my grandparents to always go with the majority. So I went with the majority. And then there was a scowl on my kindergarten teacher's face. She looked mad and she said, okay, if you all believe in God, let's see if your God exists. And if he does, if he hears your prayer. Everybody on your knees, so we all went down on our knees, fold your arms, shut your eyes, and pray to your God to give you two pieces of candy to put them right in front of you on the desks. So we did. Then the teacher said, okay, open your eyes. Now, did your God give you two pieces of candy? No. So either he doesn't love you or he just doesn't exist and doesn't hear your prayers. However, raise your eyes to this huge, wonderful portrait of our leader, the president of Russia, Stalin. If you pray to Stalin, you will see what happens. Miracles will happen in your life. Everybody on your knees, fold your arms, shut your eyes, and pray to Stalin for two pieces of candy. Everybody did, and when we opened our eyes, there were two pieces of candy for each one of us. All 40 of us in the classroom clapped joyfully our hands and decided 
we definitely have a new God, and his name is Stalin. I went home and told my parents and grandparents what had happened, and I was surprised that everybody started crying. And they decided that something has to be done. They knew somehow that the janitor of the school had walked in in stocking feet while we were praying to Stalin and deposited two pieces of candy on each of our desks. So my family had a family council and they decided to take me to church and introduce me to God. So mom, I think this next story is Danielle's. So I'm going to go over and find her and the people. Oh my goodness, there's a lot of people. Oh, here you are, Danielle. Let me unmute you. Hi. I'm happy to be with all of you. I, this is amazing. Um, just before I start, I wanted to say that I have spent my entire, I spent my entire childhood praying for the doors of Bulgaria to be open to the missionaries. And here you are. Thank you. After, after my mother came and confessed to her family that uh, she had been taught about the supremacy of Stalin, they, as as she said, they resolved to take her to church. So who better to go to church with than your grandmother? Um, my great-grandmother, Martha, took her to, here's the picture, the Alexander Nevsky Cathedral, a beautiful place. And they went at night and my grandmother taught her how to light candles and pray and how to send those prayers to heaven with the candles. Um, she, my mom said a prayer about being able to do well in school, being able to please her teacher, things like that at her young age. That's what she was focused on. Um, that evening during the, what seemed never ending service, my mom heard some explosions, almost like fireworks outside of the church. And she told her grandmother, who couldn't hear quite as well, she kept asking, what is that? What is that? And soon her grandmother, Martha, said, it's a raid on the church. Let's get out of here. So they took each other by the hand and snuck out of the church as fast and as as carefully as possible. Um, at the time, there was no electricity turned on outside. Uh, everything was pitch black. And so they went home kind of feeling for, is that the pastry store? Okay, is this the, okay, this is the bread store. And, and they just, just kind of felt their way back home in the pitch black. Um, what, a, what an amazing situation, what an amazing introduction to church, uh, as they talked about God ever, um, they couldn't speak out loud because neighbors could hear them and turn them in. So they would write on, I think we just lost the orange peel picture, but we, they, would, they would write on the orange peels um, what they wanted to communicate with each other, anything contraband, and then they would burn the orange peels like potpourri or put them in a, a compote kind of um, pot. So that was an interesting way to communicate about religion in a place where that was not allowed. Thanks, Danielle. Um, the next story we're going to tell is, um, so as my mom experienced um, these, these things and her family experienced this oppression in Bulgaria, they prayed really hard um, for a way to escape. And uh, my grandfather, 
Kirill P. Kiryakov, he um, found out from work that uh, one of the seven dental technicians in Bulgaria um, in his office was going to be chosen to go represent Bulgaria in Algeria. So he filled out the paperwork. Um, he didn't have a lot of um, confidence that he was going to be chosen because he was the youngest one. Um, but he filled out the paperwork and uh, a few weeks later he came into work and everyone was already there. And the, the leader of the, um, of, of the um, dental technician lab, we'll, we'll call him Georgi, he, um, he said, okay, you know, it's obvious that all of us um, would like to go um, to uh, Algeria on this assignment. So the fairest thing to do is going to be to take a piece of paper. We're going to tear it into seven different sheets of paper and we're going to put it into a hat. Okay. And on the sheets of paper, on each sheet, we're going to write no, but on one, we're going to write yes. So that's what they did. They put it in a hat and they passed it around and everybody drew out of the hat. And my grandfather got the yes. Um, this was very frustrating to um, the rest of those in the lab. And so they uh, said, no, we have to, we have to draw again. Um, so my grandpa reluctantly put it, you know, back in the hat. And um, they, they passed the hat around again and um, everybody drew and my grandfather uh, drew the yes. And um, now they were even more frustrated and perturbed and they said, okay, well, we need to do it one more time just so it'll be three out of three, um, you know, just to make sure that he's the guy to go. So, so they put all their pieces of paper back in, they passed the hat around and my grandfather drew the yes. And uh, at this time, Georgi says, okay, well, it's obvious what's happened here. You have taken your piece of paper and folded it in a very special way so that you could find it in the hat. So the three uh, first times don't count. We are going to take a new piece of paper and tear it and we're gonna put it into a box. Um, because that will make all the difference. So um, they passed the box around and my grandfather drew the yes. So that is the fourth time. The fifth time they had him draw blindfolded. The sixth time they had him draw last. And the seventh time they had him leave the room and he still, and someone, someone drew in his stead and they still drew the yes for him. So seven, seven times out of seven, um, he got the yes to go. So my dad figured that out and it is one chance in 823,543. So it's, it's just under a ch one chance in a million that he would have been chosen to go to Algeria. Um, and um, that's, um, that's what happened. And, they, and it, was a, it was against the rules to say, you know, that they believe in, in God or anything. So they, um, they basically said, well, somebody wants you in Algeria. So um, my mom is now going to tell um, the story about, um, uh, being in Algeria and uh, escaping to France and meeting the missionaries. So let me unmute her. So we left Bulgaria on the 1st of June. My dad had preceded us. Uh, he arrived in Algeria the 1st of May. A month later, the 1st of June, my brother Peter my mom and I arrived and 
at that point, um, we started a new life. We found an apartment in the center of Oran, uh, which is on the Mediterranean in Algeria, and lived there for two years. We learned French, went to French schools, and it was quite an adjustment saying bye to all our friends. I was 16 and my brother was 13. When the two years were over, um, I was surprised one night that my mom and dad were talking in whispers about not going back to Bulgaria, but trying to go to France and escaping. In order to, in order to do that, um, my, um, my dad had to go to Algiers, where the Bulgarian embassy was, and request uh, a special permission to leave the country. It was called To Whom It May Concern. So he went to Algiers, traveled on the train a long time, and the people at the embassy said to my dad, we know what you want to do. You want this permission in order to get your family and yourself out of Algeria and to escape from not going back to Bulgaria. We will never give you this piece of paper. However, if you really want this piece of paper, then you can have it just for yourself. If you buy three tickets uh, for your family to go back to Bulgaria, on the Algerian plane waiting for you in two days. So my dad went ahead and bought the three tickets and took the piece of paper, which was uh, written only on his name. He came home and he was telling my mom how his hopes were all dashed because we couldn't leave Algeria, we were stuck there. And I burst into their door and said to them, let me see this paper. So they showed me a just regular piece of paper um, typed up. And in the blanks, his name was written in handwriting, Kirill Peter Kiryakov. And then the address where we lived and that was it. And then under my dad's name, I noticed that there were two um, free lines. And usually those lines were taken by other names that were listed. So I said to my dad and mom, you know what? I can forge under the name of my dad, I can put and his family in French. And they said, how can you do that? This is purple ink and uh, we, we don't know where to buy it. I said, I can mix different inks, achieve this color, and then um, try to learn the, um, the way this person wrote my dad's name. So I spent the next two days just practicing and did a good forgery. And with that uh, piece of paper, we went to um, um, the Algerian Prefecture, which is Algerian City Hall in our city, and um, um, presented the paper. And the two people there, a woman and a man, um, looked carefully at the paper and said, that's very unusual that one paper is given to a family of four members. And plus, it's very unusual that they don't put the names of, of those people, but they put a and their and his family. Um, so, my mom heard all this and started reacting and fainted in my dad's hands. Um, we revived my mom 
And while these people were examining the paper, uh, they requested our four passports. And uh, the woman said, you know what, to the man, let me just pick up the phone and call the American, em uh, the um, Bulgarian embassy in Algiers to see what's happening. Right at that moment, as she was picking up the phone, um, there were gunshots outside and um, um, the other phone rang. The man rushed in and said to the woman, immediately stamp their passports with exit visas from us because there are people demonstrating outside and we need to get these people out and lock the doors and go home. Um, so they quickly stamped our passport. And with those passports, we went to the, the French, um, not embassy, but consulate. We went to the French consulate and they gave us tourist visas. And we bought tickets to get on a ship uh, to go to Marseille. Um, we quickly got home and did not bring any suitcases because we were being watched. Um, we had turned all our um, savings into money and we sold the money into our clothes. And um, in the darkness of the night, got on the ship and um, went and landed in Marseille. In Marseille, we bought a map, a map of France. And we sat in a park and we said, where should we go? My dad said, the furthest away from the Bulgarian embassy, which is in Paris. So um, he said, also the furthest away from the Bulgarian consulate, which is in Marseille. So we knew we needed to get out of Marseille. We bought tickets for the train to go to Paris, then exchanged the tickets and decided to go to the furthest point, which happened to be Rennes, R-E-N-N-E-S, in Brittany. We arrived there and um, rented an apartment and got into school. Um, my parents found jobs there and about um, nine or 10 months after we had settled down in Rennes, uh, two missionaries knocked on my door. I was home getting ready for a final exam. And um, the two missionaries were missionaries of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, their names were Elder Michael Bendio and Elder David Barclay. And uh, Elder Bendio, I believe, is here today. Elder Bendio, if, if you're here, can you wait? Oh, I see you. Okay. I'm actually going to unmute you so you can say hello. <laughs> Go ahead and say hello. Hi, Julie. <laughs> Hi, Julie. Hi, Michael. <laughs> We've become very good friends, Michael yes, and I and, um, and, and his wife, Dara. Okay. They're Go ahead wonderful and people. Go ahead and continue with the story. So they knocked on, on my door and I opened the door with, um, I had several chains and through the, I peeked through and said, um, how can I help you? And they said, we're missionaries of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I stopped them and I said, you have a church with a very, very long name. And I'm not interested. And they said they wanted to tell me about a restored church. They showed me some pictures of families. And they had a picture book. And they had a Book of Mormon. Um, they had a triple and then a Bible. And I said, I can't let you in because I'm by myself. 
but my parents are coming back um, in a couple of hours. And so they told me later that they felt, they felt the spirit and the spirit told them to wait. So they sat down in front of the door. I shut the door and I got a stool with a pillow and I watched them through the peephole because I'm a very curious person. So as I was watching through the peephole, I saw that they, I couldn't see them very well, but I could see that they were reading from two black books with gold letters. And obviously one was the Book of Mormon and the other one was the Bible. And when my parents came and my brother, um, there is an old Bulgarian tradition to always invite those who are at your door for dinner. Or if you don't, you'll have bad luck for a month. So we invited Elder Bendio and Elder Barclay and they came and presented to us the first discussion. And um, um, this was happening in April. And then um, my parents and I were baptized on the 9th of July that same year. And um, we started a new life after our baptism. Uh, six months later, um, I came to the States as a freshman at BYU. Um, the missionaries helped me fill out an application to BYU. I got a scholarship and uh, went my first semester to um, winter 1967, winter semester of 1967 at BYU. Um, met my husband, Tom Caswell, the 25th of January, 1969, and graduated in 1969, um, got my master's in 1971, and uh, my husband Tom and I um, decided that it would be good to uh, get jobs in the Washington DC area. And uh, we uh, started a new life um, in um, Vienna, Virginia. I started working for the Bulgarian Service of the Voice of America as a journalist and an editor, also a radio announcer. And um, my husband worked for the Commerce Department in Washington, D.C. Um, our purpose was to join the Foreign Service, uh, which we did. Mom, I'm just going to stop you here for one second because I, I wanted you to jump to the story of um, uh, President Wilkinson and how he was instrumental in, in bringing your parents to the States. Okay, um, rewind a little while I was at BYU. Um, my parents turned in their applications to become immigrants and come on an immigrant visa to the States. Uh, however, they were refused because my dad had been a member of the Communist Party. Um, and there was a law in the States which prohibited anybody who had been a member of the Communist Party anywhere in the world to enter the United States on any type of visa. So um, at that point, I received um, 65 handwritten pages by my father who explained in those how he had been made um, to join the Communist Party under duress and how he had been beaten and uh, threatened that if he didn't join, uh, my mom, my brother, and I would be killed. So I translated the 65 pages and I went and talked to um, my foreign, uh, foreign student advisor, Dr. Bailiff at BYU. 
and he introduced me to President Wilkinson of uh, BYU at the time, um, President Ernest Wilkinson. And President Wilkinson then introduced me to Senator Bennett Sr., the senator um, of Utah. Um, and Senator Bennett took the translation of my dad's uh, explanation how he joined the Communist Party. And Senator Bennett wrote a private bill which um, he sent to the American Embassy in Paris. And he also presented the private bill to the Senate. Um, it was never passed because my parents were immediately accepted as immigrants or given um, the immigrant status from the Paris-France uh, embassy, um, personally by the American ambassador at that time. And my parents arrived uh, to Salt Lake City, Utah, on the 1st of April, 1969. Perfect. I think this is a good spot to move to meeting President Benson in Uruguay. So my dad did join the Foreign Service, and um, he's related to his, uh, uh, the Caswell family is related to sister, um, Flora Benson, and so my dad was invited to a meeting in Uruguay. Is that right, Dad? You were. Oh, I was yeah. just saying yeah. you were invited to a to a meeting, a family reunion in Uruguay uh, of sorts, of, of with the Benson family, and President Benson. I guess the details aren't important. You're in Uruguay with President Benson. Let's get to that story. Okay, so uh, yeah, we were living in Brazil at the time. Uh, I had been to Sao Paulo when we made a trip to, to Uruguay. And, uh, we, we need to hear you a little bit louder, Dad. If there's a microphone or something. Okay. So we were in Brazil at that time, and we traveled to Uruguay. We made a, a little trip uh, from Brazil to Uruguay. And uh, we were just in Julian and me. And while we were there, uh, while we were invited to a, um, a luncheon, uh, that apostle, Professor uh, Pat Benson, and his wife, Flora, uh, were, were visiting Uruguay at the time. He was there to actually dedicate the country to Uruguay for the preaching of the gospel. They had, had, uh, had discovered that uh, at one point the entire continent of South America had been dedicated, but they had not been into the country. So, so uh, and, and uh, we were invited to sister Benson's father uh, is my great grandfather so she is she was my aunt and so uh, Julie and I were invited to this luncheon at the mission home and uh, at, at that time uh, we there was, there was a long table in the dining room and there were several other guests and the president Benson uh, asked that we just go around the circle go around the table and each person would introduce themselves he said just, say, just give me your name and where you're from and something about you what?
get up by uh, Julie said to two President Benson, um, said, well, you, you've, uh, you've asked me all kinds of questions about Bulgaria. Is it okay if I just ask you one question? And he said, okay, go ahead and shoot. And then as you see on the picture here, why she said, well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll first, first the question, the first question was, um, can you tell me when we will have missionaries in, in, in Bulgaria preaching the gospel? And he looked at her and said, uh, no, Sister Caswell, I, I can't tell you that. Now, Julie is not easily discouraged. And so uh, she, she said, well, let me rephrase the question. Of course, Julie was about 30 at the time, or late 20s, I guess. And so she said, will I be alive when the gospel comes to Bulgaria? And President Benson paused for a second, and he looked her in the eye, and he said, Mr. Caswell, not only will you still be alive when the gospel is taught in Bulgaria, but he said, I will still be alive when we have missionaries in Bulgaria. And I, I get goosebumps even talking about it, but I certainly did at that time. Keeping in mind that President Benson at that time was in his late 70s, this was in uh, um, 1979, I believe. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, it, it, uh, we, we got a little glimpse into what was going to happen. And uh, in, in, in hindsight, we realized there are some things that the prophet, and there are many things, in fact, that the prophet knows of, but that he is not allowed to, to tell the general membership of the church because it's not the right time yet. But uh, I think that he realized, looking at Julie, that she would be instrumental in the process of preaching the gospel in Bulgaria and, uh, and in translating the Book of Mormon and other things, and so he felt that it was okay to, uh, to tell her. So uh, th this, was, uh, th th this was quite we had been uh, praying that, uh, that the doors of the different countries around the world would be open to the preaching of the gospel. But uh, again, the, the grip of communism on the Iron Curtain country seemed so tight that uh, it, it seemed like a, a, a distant, uh, a distant wish, and it didn't, it didn't seem like that was going to happen. And now, now here we were told by an apostle of the Lord. So that was, uh, that, that, was, that was amazing. And we, were, uh, we, we knew something that uh, was going to end up affecting the rest of, the rest of our lives. Thank you, Dad. That was perfect. So bring Mom back so she can tell about the, the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, I wanted to tell you that uh, we saw President Benson um, in 1987 and um, last time I had seen him was 79 so it was at a family reunion the Daly family reunion and uh, the Amazon family reunion sorry um, my husband's great-grandfather's family reunion and President Benson was there and I just passed by shook his hand and said I know you don't remember me and he said how can I forget your sister Caswell from Bulgaria and but I didn't have time to ask him again when will Bulgaria be open I've waited long enough at that point um, he was just he winked at me um, two years later, in um, 1989, um, we were watching in our uh, TV room downstairs the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was on November 9th, 1989. And many of you remember what happened. I was crying and my husband was crying and we were watching the Berlin Wall just fall and couldn't believe it. We looked at each other and we said, Bulgaria is next. So at the time, I was, uh, we, we were in Washington, D.C. 
in the Washington DC area. We were living in Manassas, Virginia um, with our six children. And I was working at the Voice of America, the Bulgarian service of the Voice of America in Washington DC. And my husband was working for the US Mint. So um, we watched the Berlin Wall fall and then we went to bed. In the middle of the night, the phone rang and the Bulgarian service of the Voice of America asked me to come broadcast, the first broadcast to Bulgaria. And still sleepy, I said, right now, I'm asleep. I'm in my pajamas. I am two hours away from Washington, D.C. And they said, no, just come as fast as you can. So they told me that it was an emergency. So quickly, I got my clothes and shoes and talked to my husband. He drove me to work while I got dressed in the car. Um, we made it in an hour from Manassas, Virginia to Washington, D.C. because there was no traffic. When I got there, I couldn't believe my eyes. Everybody was celebrating and no one was in a condition to talk in front of the mic. That's why they needed me. And they knew that I was LDS and I didn't drink and they said, we only have one person here who could broadcast. And it was a very interesting experience because I never really thought that they would choose me to broadcast such what we call hard news, important news to the Bulgarian people. So they whisked me fast um, into the studio, put me in front of a mic, and for the first time they said, you're just going to handle this by yourself. You will not going to have a second person. We usually have two people take turns when we read the news. And they put a wad of paper uh, in my hand, and I hadn't even read the news, and that's not good because there could be a mistake and uh, you don't know where um, the where the periods are and where uh, exclamation points are so you're not really well prepared to be a professional MC or a professional broadcaster. Nevertheless, I was the only one there so I started reading and for the first time in 20 years of broadcasting, my voice broke and I couldn't hide my emotion because what they asked me to read and to say to the Bulgarian people was, you're finally free. Um, the dictator of 35 years is under house arrest and many, many other pieces of news. And then when I gave the news to my Bulgarian people, um, the, we waited a certain amount of time, maybe two or three hours. And then we read 355,000 names of men and women who had been massacred after the communists came to Bulgaria in 1944. And basically what they had done, they had eliminated most people with master's degrees and PhDs so that they could have their own um, society of educators and education. Um, and later, I wanted to tell you when 
I went to Bulgaria in 1991 when my dad was there as the first mission president. Um, my parents wanted me to organize firesides, mainly for the young people of Bulgaria, like um, uh, high school kids, middle school kids, and also university students. And most of those firesides, I would tell them about the church, the restored gospel, and every time I would open my mouth, there was a stunned silence. Everybody was just listening to me in the rapture. And I thought, wow, Bulgaria is really opening up. Everybody will be listening to the gospel. So finally, I found out why they were so interested in hearing what I was talking about. One university student raised his hand and said, you're the one. You voice announced to the Bulgarian people through the voice of America that we're free and that our dictator is put in house arrest. I recognized your voice. So everybody started clapping. And I was very disappointed because I thought that it was the gospel they were interested in. But they were just, they remembered who had announced to them that they were free. That's perfect, Mom. Okay, so I think what we're going to do is um, move in just a second here to Danielle um, to talk about um, uh, your dad being called as mission president and then I'll give a, a quick thing about the um, translating the Book of Mormon and the hymns, and then we'll just end with our testimonies. Does that sound okay? Okay. So um, before I head on over to Danielle, I just wanted to um, read a sentence or two from the dedicatory prayer um, that was given by President Nelson to dedicate the land of Bulgaria. And um, it, it was in February. Um, in fact, hang on, let me look up. Um, shortly after, I've got the date right here, February 13th, 1990. So not that long after the fall of the wall. Um, so this is from the dedicatory prayer. Uh, hang on just one second. Okay. Thy hand has been evident in the miracles of recent events. Um, so bear in mind, this was right really close to the falling of the Berlin Wall. Recent events that have brought liberty heretofore unknown. It, meaning the land of Bulgaria, is rich with thine elect, those of the lineage of Israel. Help them to learn who they are. So Danielle, now I'm going to uh, move to you to um, how uh, our grandpa was called to um, be the mission president in Bulgaria, the, to open the mission. Hi, um, it's fun to tell our story. Thanks for listening. There, I just look around and there's so many people with beautiful stories. Wow, I'd love to sit here for hours and hours and hear everybody's stories. Um, my grandmother those of you that knew her knew when she got an idea in her head she she went for it right then there's no no slowing her down um she had been retired from jc penny for a while this is in virginia and, uh, my grand retired and still trying to put together what day or it the story goes that he retired like on a tuesday or something and maybe it was the last day of the month um, and that's why a Tuesday and not a Friday or something like that. Anyway, she decided on his first day of retirement, she said, you know, we should go on a mission. And he was a, a very strong man who also was wise and knew when to go along with her. And so he, uh, he said, sure, that's fine. So they got in her mustard yellow Mercedes and drove to 
the bishop's work. And the bishop, of course, said something like, oh, hello, brother and sister Kirikov. It's so good to see you. You know, what, what can I do for you? Oh, well, we want to go on a mission, she says. And he says, wonderful. How about on Sunday, you come and talk to me and we'll fill out paperwork. And um, she wouldn't hear of it. No, 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 no paperwork. No, that's not how it's going to go. We want to go on a mission. Like now, we're ready. And so the bishop did what any good bishop would do. Uh, he sent them to the stake president. So they got into her mustard yellow Mercedes and drove to the stake president's work. And the president was a very nice man and he said, hello, welcome. And she says, we want to go on a mission. And he says, that's wonderful. How about talk to your bishop on Sunday and fill out paperwork to, to go on a mission. And um, they're talking and talking and no, she won't. No, 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 no. She will not fill out paperwork. Finally, they have this one exchange where the stake president says something like, uh, but don't, don't you understand everybody fills out paperwork to do this. And she looks at him like, that's where we don't understand each other. She looked and said, president, we are not everybody. And uh, so we'll leave them in Virginia. And the same day in Utah, there was a man, and I believe his name is Brother Johnson. If anybody has information, let me know, because I'd love to talk to him. But Brother Johnson was in charge of the missionary, the senior missionary uh, couples, and he came to work in the morning and receives a phone call from President Hinckley saying, we are, we've just received word, we're going to open a mission in Sofia, Bulgaria. We would like, we, we would love to have a native open the mission. We need a lot of help. We, you know, we need to find somebody. And uh, Brother Johnson says, that's great. Well, I'll do it. I'll, I'll find somebody. Oh, says President Hinckley, by the way, I need that name by the close of business today. And Brother Johnson starts maybe stammering. I don't know. But wait, what? What? I mean, maybe he was way more faithful than I'm imagining. Maybe it's just me that would do that. <laughs> Not to say that he wasn't faithful. I don't mean to. Anyway, the point is, I'm sure he was surprised. And uh, President Hinckley, right before hanging up the phone, said, Brother Johnson, the Lord will provide and hangs up the phone. And um, so Brother Johnson has his, says, hold all my calls. And he's just sweating bullets. He looks, he looks around, he finds a Bulgarian man in Canada, but the man has just recently left the church. So that didn't work out. Um, he's just, he, he doesn't know any Bulgarians anywhere. He went to the cafeteria and just announced to everybody, please, does anybody know any Bulgarians, just anything, any lead? And once I was telling this story and um, a couple from my ward came up and said, we were there that day, we remember. He was literally standing on a chair saying, anybody, anybody that knows anybody Bulgarian, please. Um, so that's how Brother Johnson's day is going. And uh, finally, the stake president in Virginia, he can't get rid of my grandparents. And so he calls the missionary department. He gets Brother Johnson's assistant. And, um, and, the, and she says, you know, they need to fill out paperwork. We're just going to do this the normal way. And uh, he says, or anyway, the stake president says, you know what? I, I can't get them to fill out paperwork. I really think they'd be good missionaries. I really think this is, I just, I just am not sure where to go from here. Finally, the assistant says, what's wrong with these people? And the stake president says, you don't understand. They're Bulgarian. And she immediately transfers him over to Brother Johnson. And that's how my grandfather was called to be the first mission president in Bulgaria. Um, it, was, it was beautiful. I actually, I don't have it with me right this second, but I was reading his patriarchal blessing last night. And there's a line in it that says, 
that he will be called to teach the gospel to his kin folks. And that was definitely fulfilled. Um, he ended up being set apart by Elder Dallin H. Oaks and the rest is history. He opened the Sofia Bulgaria mission. I know a lot of you knew him. What a wonderful man. Okay, there's <laughs> um, another thing that we're trying to track down. And if anybody knows this, would you put it in the chat? Because what a beautiful resource. Um, my understanding is that he, uh, when the wall fell and communism went bust, um, he had some, he had an apartment that belonged to his family that was restored to him. And uh, he was, it was a little bit of an insult because their family had, had a bunch of land and they, and he was being given this, this little apartment that he really had no, no use for. And so my understanding is he donated it to the church, but I don't know where that is or anything. So if anybody knows, put it in the chat, cause I would love to hear if, you know, where is that apartment? What, what happened to it? Okay. Um, I think my sister, Michelle is back up oh yes perfect sorry about that my internet just uh froze for a minute um so um the i'm just gonna tell you a couple things real fast um so let's see here um i wanted to talk just for a second about um the translation of the book of mormon and the hymns that my mom got to do um, so my mom wasn't the only one that worked on the translation of the Book of Mormon. Um, it, it went through, the, the first one I think was Sister Elena Koicheva, is that right mom? Um, and yeah, she started it in the 1930s. And then my mom started it, I believe when my brother, older brother Tom was born. Um, and um let's see the it, it went on all throughout my childhood and the the final copy of the book of mormon did not come out until my mission so i was just figuring this out with my mom yesterday um we realized here i will put up the slide oh hang on i'll share it too um, we realized something pretty interesting about the Book of Mormon. So um, she was working on the translation of the Book of Mormon and the hymns. Um, and before I tell you that interesting set, she had an experience while she was um, translating in Alma. She had a moment where she had this tiny typewriter that was uh, made in Germany and she wasn't, it, it had the Cyrillic alphabet on it and it was really difficult. Um, to do and she was hunting and pecking and um she was she got to the book of alma and she was really frustrated and she said alma why did you write so much i am never going to get through this book and she said as soon as she said that she felt like someone was behind her and she felt her hands start flying and she said she was no longer hunting and pecking she was just flying through the book of alma and uh, that happened until the end of the book of alma and she felt like every book had its own personality and she felt the urgency felt by the prophets that had written the Book of Mormon to get the Book of Mormon translated, which I thought was really beautiful. So here's something that I also thought was really interesting. Um, so it took about 65 days for Joseph Smith to translate the Book of Mormon with the Book of Mormon translation being begun in the 1930s, it took about 68 years for the Book of Mormon to be translated into Bulgarian, which I thought was amazing. And um, it really strengthened my testimony in the prophet Joseph Smith and in his divine calling. And I love how this year we're talking about the restoration of the gospel and the 200th anniversary 
And the incredible thing about this is you missionaries, you are part of the restoration of the gospel. The restoration does continue and you are part of it. And I thought that was so incredible. Um, I think uh, the, I, I think I'm going to skip the story of, of uh, the hymns and we're just going to go ahead um, to give me, uh, my mom, my sister, and uh, myself a, a chance to just finish up with our testimony. So um, I'm, I'm going to turn the time over to my mom for um, her testimony and then my sister and then myself. And then um, we can also, if there's um, questions, I've seen some pop up in the chat, we can open it up for uh, a Q&A. And just so you know, one of the questions was, is it being recorded? This is being recorded. So we'll try to get that out to people. But okay, so mom, if you will uh, bear your testimony, I'm gonna unmute. Um, Dad, I see you there. Do you mind putting mom on to bear her testimony? Is that all right? Right. Okay, perfect. Hang on a sec. Let me unmute you. Okay. Go okay. Ahead. I think I'm on now, right? I wanted to bear my testimony that I know that the Book of Mormon is true. Um, I've read it over and over in many different languages. Um, when I was translating it, I had the German translation, the French translation, the Russian translation, and the English original. And I struggled and struggled because I wanted to make the Bulgarian translation as good as the English one. And also, for those people who can read the Book of Mormon in, in English, you're lucky because it's incredible. It is the most perfect book on the face of this earth. And I love it with all my heart. I know that we will be responsible for the time we take to read the Book of Mormon and ponder. And um, I know that Jesus is the Christ. And um, today, um, is the Bulgarian Easter. So I'm going to say it in Bulgarian, Christos Voskrese, which means Christ has risen. And even under communism, on Easter day, we whispered it in each other's ears. One person would say, Christos Voskrese, Christ has risen. And the other person would say, Istina Voskrese, which is, yea, he truly has risen. I know Jesus is the Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. And I know that he's coming soon. I know that the missionaries going to Bulgaria were handpicked by Heavenly Father, because the Bulgarian people have been, waited, have been waiting a long time to have those missionaries and to know the truth through you. I wanted to thank you for being there, and I wanted to especially thank the parents who are supporting you, because Five of my six kids went on missions, and I know what it is to have a missionary and to worry about a missionary. I want to thank President Davis for the wonderful work he has done in my country. And I know that we're in the last days. 
we're going through difficult, a difficult period of time, but I also know that good days are ahead, like our president says, and we should be happy and strong. And I say this testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mom. Um, Danielle, I am going to unmute you to bear your testimony. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Sultana, I see you on my screen. You're beautiful. <laughs> um, President and Sister Davis, thank you for your sacrifice. And thank you to all of the missionaries, past and present, for your sacrifices and showing your love. Um, I wanted to go on my mission to Bulgaria so badly, in fact, that I opened my mission call all by myself because if it wasn't Bulgaria, I knew I would cry. And I was not called to Bulgaria and I did cry. But I had a most amazing mission in Slovenia nearby. And it was not the wrong thing. It was perfect for me. And now I get to be with to meet with them as well as to still be a part of this beautiful family of Bulgarian missionaries and those that love them. I know that this is the work of our Heavenly Father and our Savior Jesus Christ. His work is love, showing love to each other, being kind to each other, and sacrificing for each other. I'm so grateful just to see you. I can't tell you how happy it makes me. Just every person, uh, when the Bendios got on, I just could hardly believe it. Can you imagine the history? Can you imagine? Elders, sisters, right now, can you imagine that there's somebody out there that you've converted that's one day going to be the mission president of some, I have no idea. We have no idea what the future will bring, but it's, it's beautiful. Remember that each person is special. Each person is important. Um, I know this church is true. I'm grateful to be a part of it. I'm grateful for the love that I've experienced during my life. And I'm so, so grateful that I know the Book of Mormon is true. I've been studying Joseph Smith and the things he went through, and it's, it's pretty amazing what he was willing to sacrifice to bring this knowledge to us. And I don't want to be a person who takes it for granted. Our amazing prophet, Russell M. Nelson, today loves us and prays for us daily, I know that. He is a prophet of God, he talks with God. Again, as part of that beautiful situation of the transmission of love from our Heavenly Father to us and from us to each other. I love you all, even the ones I don't know. I'm so, so grateful to see you. Thank you for coming. And I do want to hear all of your stories. Wow, if you can just chat forever. <laughs> I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, let me pin my video. Um, I just want to bear my testimony. I, I was um, going through my journal. So just so you guys know, the reason there's gates and bars and everything at the MTC is me because I used to tag along to my mom's classes pretty much from when she started teaching the missionaries um, to when she, um, you know, stopped and started teaching the, the um, Bulgarian culture class at BYU. She's still doing that. Um, I, so I basically have gone to the MTC for, oh gosh, years. Um, and I, it's so neat to see everybody in the chat. Like I'm seeing, um, Sister Revel and Elder Woolsey and Elder Taylor and everybody. It's really, really neat to see all of you. Um, I, 
I had a unique experience with uh, my brother to be taught um, by my mom in the MTC, which meant that my accent had to be perfect, even if she was working with elders who would say the name of the church like Tsarkva, not Isus Christos, Nasvetite od Pilslednite Deni, you know, and she would be like, Good job, elder. And I would be like, and then I would you know, start the first discussion and my mom would be like, oh, lush accent, you need to work on it. And I was like, oh my gosh. But she also did smuggle me Bombay house into the MTC and everything. In fact, when I first opened my call, I remember looking at it because, you know, you just heard the whole story of her forging a government document. So I was looking at the 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 signature of president hinckley i was like hinckley am i sure did she mix the ink you know is, it, is this a real mission call um i uh was ecstatic that i got to serve my mission there and and i um and while i was on my mission having my brother called there um my sister who you just heard her testimony she actually taught at the MTC before she was ever a missionary. So she actually had, on the day that she came in to serve her mission, um, she had a teacher tag, a white tag on in the morning, and she had a black missionary tag on by the afternoon. So just know how much love and how much work and how much um, gratitude we have for you serving your mission in Bulgaria. Um, we're so, we're so grateful. I wanted to read just real quick and then, um, uh, gosh, I don't know, we might have five minutes for, for Q&A, but um, I was reading in my journal um, from my mission, um, one of the things um, it said, let's see. Um, I found a little pamphlet. This was when I was in the MTC. I found a little pamphlet of a bunch of spiritual experiences from missionaries past, Elder Kawai, Elder Caldwell, Elder Mather, Elder Tonus, Elder Anderson, Sister Davis, and many, many more. If my elders only knew the ranks they were joining. If they only knew the strength of those elders and sisters, the humility and personality. I'm so, so grateful. For you to be serving in Bulgaria. I know that the gospel is true. I know that this restored gospel is God's power on earth. I know that the Book of Mormon is true. I watched my mom translate it and it took years and years and I remember the things she went through as she did it and I thought, why is this so hard? And it just made me think that maybe the Book of Mormon can't come to a country um, without sacrifice. I am so grateful for the prophet Joseph Smith for the restoration that you are a part of. You are a part of history. You are a part of bringing the gospel to your brothers and sisters on the earth. I am so, so grateful for this gospel. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And I will turn the time back over to President and Sister Davis. Oh, hang on, let me unmute you. Okay. Wow, <clears throat> Sister Davis, you have- What a legacy we have to live up to, oh my word. You can see that the Savior has had his hand in the beginnings of Bulgaria, and he has continued. I want you to know, all of you, that he is still moving his work along and that he's still in the details of this work. It's amazing <laughs> to see how uh, he knew every detail of how to make it start. And we just only hope that we have moved it along just a little bit more. And it's a very slow process. And um, you, you sometimes think that it's almost um, a parked car at some points, but in reality, it's not. And you can see 
through the years that it just continues to move forward and the Lord has his eye upon Bulgaria. This is no sacrifice for us. This is great joy and we are so grateful that we've been given this opportunity to be part of this marvelous work in this beautiful country with these people that we love with all of our hearts. And uh, we just hope that we uh, have moved it forward just another inch. Um, we hope that that's possible. And, and I just wanted to tell you that we are grateful for the foundation that all of you set here. Well, I'd like to express the same thing. Thank you so much. It's, it's an honor, it's humbling, it's a privilege to stand on the shoulders of this wonderful family that has sacrificed so much to bring the gospel to the people of Bulgaria. It doesn't surprise me some of the stories you said about your family. I know lots of Bulgarians now and they're tough, resilient people. They, they know what they want and they, and they go after it. it. Sounds just like your, your, uh, your grandmother did as well. And just like you have continued to carry out that wonderful legacy. Um, some of you may not know um, Elder um, Dennis Neunswander. Probably a lot of you do. He covered this area for quite a while. Well, uh, we've been privileged to know him for, I don't know, several, several years now. He visited us when we lived in the country of Oman. He then visited us again with he and his wife uh, in Turkey. And then we had the privilege to have him in our home here a third time here in Sofia. And um, as we were uh, discussing his experience, he said, you know, President, he says, I, I know East Europe very well. And he spent a lot of time of, of his service in the East Europe area. And, um, and he said, when I, after traveling Europe, he said, I felt impressed that, the, that the, the blood of Israel ran most through three distinct groups of people. He said, the Ukrainians, the Hungary, Hungarians, and the Bulgarians. And, um, and you look at what we have today with a temple in Kiev, a temple now announced in Hungary. I can't wait to Bulga for Bulgaria to, to add that to their list as well. And um, uh, a few months ago when Elder Rindland was here, I had the opportunity to, to speak at a, at a Bulgaria-wide conference. And, um, and I used the same the quote from the, from the um, a dedicatory prayer by President Nelson that simply said, teach them who they are. And then after hearing uh, Elder Neunswander, the uh, Bulgarian brothers and sisters that are on this, this call, you are special people. You are tough, resilient people. And we still may not be large in numbers, but we have the most awesome, wonderful, inspired, dedicated, faithful saints. And many of you I see on the screen here today. And like I said at the beginning of this meeting, we feel, we feel like somehow we were shortchanged by not being able to spend three, year, three years here with you. But at the same time, we are so grateful that we had this two years to spend with the wonderful people of Bulgaria. So thank you again. And what an inspired um, uh, fireside, I guess we'll call it tonight. And uh, there's so much that we, I'd love to share with you what's going on in Bulgaria since the coronavirus. You, you wouldn't believe it, but my missionaries have to go to bed. We've got to be obedient if we're expecting to, to have the blessings of the Lord in our lives and to bless the lives of the Bulgarian people. But to, suffice it to say, uh, we are having, uh, the work has not slowed down because of the confinement, the quarantine of the COVID-19 situation that we're in today. We hear ambulances all day long outside of our apartment, but yet the work of the Lord continues to move forward as we reset and rethink about the way we do missionary work. And our missionaries are, you know, hooray for, for Israel. These, these missionaries are unbelievable in what they're doing and the courage that they have and the creativity that we've uncovered during this, this crisis. This is the Lord's church, and it is here in Bulgaria as well. And I just want to thank, praise, honor those that have served so faithfully here, those missionaries, and those that have sacrificed so much to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to this, this wonderful people. 
And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Can I ask some questions? Well, what time is it? It's 9.30. So I don't know how we're going to do this when we have uh, nine. Uh, one time we had 90 some on the line here. We're down to 78. But um, if somebody had a burning question that they wanted to ask the, uh, this family, um, you know, please let us know. I did have one of the members that was very instrumental, um, Marius Chapakov, that wanted to share something. It, would that be all right? Oh, oh, sorry. As you can unmute yourself. Okay. You know, we love Marius. He's a good friend of ours. He's living in Portugal right now. And we just thank the world of him. And I'd love to have him be able to say a few closing words before we end. And then afterwards, I think Sister Carlson is going to give us a closing prayer. Are you going to do any questions? This is it. Okay, that sounds great. Let me find Marius and I'll unmute him. Okay, Marius, take it away. You can close us up here. Marius, you can go ahead and, and share what you wanted to share. Oh, bottom left is the, uh, let me, I thought I unmuted you. Let me, let me see. Okay, I think I unmuted you now. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, I start to cry before I start to speak. Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be just very short. Uh, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> well, Maybe it's a, it's a hard moment for me. I know the I've known the the Casos for so many years. For it'll be it's twenty nine years now, twenty eight years, and I just want to share that uh, just to add to their wonderful story that uh, I remember being in their home for the first ever translation of of conference. We had one computer and worked the whole night and all these kids were there. Now they've grown up. Uh, <clears throat> and that was such an example and such a blessing. Um, and uh, I spent uh, a week with their grandparents in Virginia. And I had so many wonderful experiences there. And uh, I just know that they have been instrumental in the Lord's work. I just want to thank them for everything they did and continue to do. And as I watched, I was watching this wonderful uh, Zoom experience tonight. I just imagine how we're in heaven right now, or not right now, but in in few years, we'll be relating so many stories. Not only this one, but personal experiences of goodness. So it's a a great incentive for me to keep keep work, keep the good work and accumulate those experiences. And I'm sure that it will be a great blessing to share one day and to, to hear. So I'm grateful again for the example and I know that the Lord has been with them and uh, they continue to, to serve. I personally was there when uh, Michelle and Bobby served in Bulgaria. So I, I want to thank them. They were wonderful missionaries. They had great testimonies, and uh, I, I was so so thankful for the, <clears throat> the examples in service and for the rest of the, the, the casos and uh, for Tom. He was so 
always so optimistic and uh, <clears throat> I mean the the dad in the family and uh, always supportive of uh, all this great mess that was going on there but uh, in uh, joking but it was a great experience so I, I'm grateful and I, uh, I love you and say this in the name of Jesus Christ amen amen now uh, remind me president Davis, who's saying the closing prayer, and I'll try to unmute them. It's uh, Sister Carlson. Okay, let me find her here. Oh, okay, thank you for waving. That's helpful. <laughs> okay, Sister Carlson, um, go ahead and say your cl the closing prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day. We thank thee for this opportunity to um, hear from all of these speakers who played such a big role in um, bringing the gospel to Bulgaria. And we thank thee for thy hand in um, letting this all happen and um, for all the many miracles along the way. And um, we thank thee for this opportunity to be part of the ongoing restoration here in this part of the world. And um, um, please help us to um, continue to press forward and to share the good news of the gospel with these people and to, um, and to have the spirit with us going forward. And um, we love thee and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, I've unmuted you, President Davis. Thank you. Well, if, um, you know, we can, I can keep the Zoom call moving along here. If others wanted to ask some questions of what's going on here currently or what's happened in the past, I'm more than willing to stay on. However, uh, the missionaries, the current missionaries, make sure you, uh, you keep the schedule, you keep your schedule on time. So, um, uh, you know, I'll just leave it open for, for a little bit here and see if anybody has anything they'd like to share. Okay, I think maybe the best way to do this, since it's we have so many of us, um, if you want to type your question on, in the chat, um, then President Davis could uh, answer, um, you know, what's going on in the mission right now, or, um, yeah, okay, so it looks like any kind of update would be great. Um, maybe President Davis, if you want to tell us uh, a little bit what missionary work looks like in Bulgaria right now, and, uh, what 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 a typical missionary schedule is looking like. <laughs> and well, remember, you have some missionaries here that were serving uh, during the Stachki. Um, they were stuck in their apartments uh, for seven or eight weeks uh, during uh, riots. This was right before I started serving in '97. So um, they they're used to the whole being in their apartment type of deal. So <laughs> go ahead. Well, it's so fun to see even some of our missionaries. You know, I, I, Sister Mann's on the on the line here, and Elder Cottom, Elder Blackburn, Elder Morwood. There's probably others that I can't see. I used to love to teach Sister Mann. I'd say, I'd say, you're you're the you're the woman, Sister Mann. She was just such an awesome missionary, so full of energy. We just uh, love seeing your bright face again, and all all of yours. Um, you know, uh, just a real brief history that I know about Bulgaria and, um, yeah, I know, but just, just real briefly, uh, you know, the missionary effort went, went to, was quite successful here at the beginning of, uh, after the, um, after the fall of the Iron Curtain and the, and the stories that we heard tonight, uh, that, that I think the church maxed out here about 3000 members. Uh, we had at least two districts, uh, Crossy will, will correct these numbers, but you get the sense that, you know, we, we had, I don't know, eight, 10 branches here in Sofia. 2007 came roll, rolling along and, and uh, a lot of our, our good members, not, not just good in that they're the quality, but just our members, a lot of our members left in that, during that period of time when, the, when they, Bulgaria became part of the EU. And, um, and so our membership suffered along with it. And just like the population in Bulgaria has declined, so has the church membership. We're now, we have about 1,100 members here now. We do not have a district. Um, we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven branches in Bulgaria. Uh, 
and uh, but just wonderful uh, uh, people. At one time, our maximum missionaries, we had 110 missionaries in serving in this mission at one time. We now have 26 Bulgarian full-time missionaries. We also have 10 Turks and um, Turkish speakers and four Persian speakers as our, as our complement. So it's really a much different mission now than it was when some of you missionaries have been home for a while would know. Um, <clears throat> we have been working with technology for a long time. Ever since we evacuated out of Istanbul, we have been watching the hand of the Lord fill in where, where man tries to stop his work. And although these things may seem impossible to man, nothing's impossible to God, as the Savior said himself. And, and so uh, we, over, the, over, over a 10-month period last year, and in, in the beginning of this year, I guess it was all last year, for 10 months, our 26 missionaries talked to more than 80,000 people on the streets in Bulgaria. And that's, and that's um, meaningful context. Just not saying, hello, how's the weather? How do you get to, you know, whatever street? These were meaningful contacts. It almost makes me want to cry. The, the dedication and the faithfulness of these wonderful missionaries. And somebody mentioned earlier that, that the Lord handpicks those that come here. We know that to be true. And uh, not only from experience, but from, from two different apostles, including my mission president, President Ballard, told me they handpicked the missionaries that come to us. And so these are wonderful missionaries here that are dedicated. Now, we didn't baptize a lot of people in, um, amongst those 80,000 people that we contacted. And I believe that things like this, 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 this um, tragedy, that this pandemic that the world's experiences in a way, just like everything else, the Lord will provide and there will be a reason for this. And I believe that this is nudges us as a church out of our old ways of doing missionary work. And now we're gonna find a new way. Uh, for two years now, we have been out of Turkey, but the work in Turkey is much more, much stronger now than it was when we were in person there, because now people are seeking us. We have people that are searching for truth, and particularly now in this troubled time here in Bulgaria, people are asking the questions of the soul. You know, why am I here? Why is this happening? Is there a God? Does God love me? Those questions they're asking, and instead of us trying to find them, they're finding us. And um, so we've had the, uh, uh, our own website. You can go to it. It's the one that we've created ourselves called the church.bg. We also have our own um, uh, Facebook page for the mission called uh, the church BG. And, um, and so we've been doing campaigns and doing boosting Google uh, ads and spending a little bit of money in our technology uh, in Turkey, as an example, we were, we're now up to between every month, we get between three and 500 referrals of people seeking truth. In Bulgaria, which is a much smaller country population-wise uh, uh, than, than Turkey, which is only about six and a half million people, we were, in the last few months, we were averaging about five conversations per day, and now we're above 10 per day. Last I checked, it was 10.8 conversations per day. So... The other thing that's great about this new method, like I said, is people that are trying to find us and people that are interested in learning and growing and developing and using their head and thinking, those are the people that we call here in the mission are people of promise. They're, and so they're young, they understand the technology and they're asking questions. And we are just excited for what we've seen so far. We've had a number of lessons now coming off the, group, the uh, Facebook group chats. And so we're, we're just excited. So we have all of our missionaries are, are quarantined and they will be that way until May 13th. We're on June 6th, which is the first Saturday in, in June. Uh, we are designated it as the Waters of Mormon Day. And we hope to be able to baptize uh, all those people that have committed that we have to wait. And we just hope that all four of our languages that we, that we that we uh, have the privilege of working with here, we have, um, we'll have a big baptismal date. So remember that date, pray for us, and we hope to be able to baptize a whole year's worth of people in one day. Uh, we have 20 some. We have uh, 28, I think, in Turkey right now on date. And we have um, over in Bulgaria, I think at least 
six, that six, are, six, or so. six or so that are on date. So we should have a huge baptism on that day. It's going to be a marvelous day. That sounds amazing. What, um, what city, so does this, what, I guess people are wondering which cities are still open to the preaching of the gospel, or does the internet mean anywhere is fair game in Bulgaria? How does it work? Well, you know, we as a church for a lot of years now, decades now, have been focused on centers of strength. Bulgaria, when it first was opened, was not, did not take that strategy. And so that's why we have so many wonderful Bulgarians. As I look around the screen, they're all over the country. We have a wonderful family out in Bellinay. Some of you may, may know Tatiana and uh, Andre and their daughter, Annie. But there's no church anywhere close to, to them. Uh, but so we are scattered, but we are, we are now focused in on our centers of strength. And really, we, we, have, we have three legitimate centers of strength in Bulgaria, and that's Varna, Plovdiv, and Sofia. However, we still have branches in Blagrovgrad, Ruse, Star Zagora, which is a very interesting story. We, when we moved here in, in April two years ago, uh, we gathered five little tiny branches in that center of Bulgaria, and we created one branch, which we call the virtual branch. And so those five little branches, Veliko Chernovo, Slevin, Yambol, Haskovo, and, and Star Zagora, all, all call into a central platform and, uh, and we manage, and, and now Brother Concho, I don't know his last name, unfortunately, out in, out in Haskell is the new branch president there. And so, so we, we combined those five and made one. And then we still have branch, a branch in Burgas. And that you, you all know President Nikolov, what a wonderful guy he is. And of course, the most the, the awesome branch president up in Varna, who's on the line with us right now. You may not recognize him with that little facial hair, We'll, we'll have to discuss that letter, President. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, then of course, up in Rusay, President Yosevo is still, he's been the branch president for a long, long time. And uh, we still have a, a great little branch up there as well. Are there any members in um, Pazirjik that are joining you through other branches? Pazirjik has been combined into the Plovdi branch. The, uh, the, we now have uh, two full-time missionaries serving from Pazirjik. The Gongovi family, you may know, and uh, and so we have we we Tom Tom Gongov Gong, Tom Gongov wasn't even a member of the church when we got here, and that's a fascinating story. Our first trip to Plovdiv, I come walking out of a, a meeting, and there's this beautiful family. And I don't know if you know them, but they're huge. They're big people, uh, and I'm a big guy, and and I look like a midget next to them. And, um, and I said, who are you guys? And, they, and, they, and, and Ellis says, you know, President, uh, we've been a member for a long time, but we've been inactive for 10 years. But I was saying, uh, my, I was, a, a thought came to my mind, I got on my knees and I prayed and a thought came to my mind that, that I needed to come back to church to help the new mission president. So we have, now they're all active. Uh, Tom is in, is in the, the Baltics learning uh, speaking Russian and their son uh, Nick is serving in the London England mission London South London South mission mm -hmm. and so great stuff and we have other Bulgarians getting ready to go so we're, we're pretty excited about it that makes me so happy we were so close to the Gangovi uh, family when uh, I was on my mission so that is just beautiful note uh, news um, is there anything else you want to share? I, I hate to keep your missionaries up late. I know we're all so excited because uh, we serve there and we're really hungry for any news in Bulgaria. Well, how about if we let the missionaries stay on till, what time is it? 10, 10 o'clock. So you got another 10 minutes. Do any of the current missionaries have any questions that they would like to ask? Yeah, if you type it into the chat, I think we'll get to your questions uh, quicker than trying to find all, all the missionaries are in Sophia. So we have very few actually there's, you know, there, there's like four or five in each of these little groups so they can raise their hand and just say it. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll try to go through and unmute all the missionaries. Raise your hand. If you're a current 
uh, missionary in Bulgaria right now, and I'll unmute your box. Just unmute them all. So, Sister Newer, do you have a uh, a question? No, she's not. <laughs> it's she, the Turkish Sophia sisters. There you go. Go ahead, sisters. I think you're unmuted. I think she was raising her hand to get her to. Because you asked that question. I'm not sure she has a question. Yeah, I don't actually have a question. <laughs> I And I think I can only unmute one person at a time. I do see the Ruse elders and APs. Do you guys have a question? I saw a hand raised over there. Oh, now everyone's super shy. Oh, okay, okay. I'm I'm unmuting you. Go ahead. No, it's just, it, it wasn't a question, but you know, you, you, I know everyone's kind of, you know, asking like, how is the missionary work going on in Bulgaria right now? And in the last three weeks, um, as we've been quarantined into our apartments, all stuck in one city, I just want to say that the missionary work is enhancing significantly um, due to the referral systems that we have and the internet. And Facebook is really enhancing the work of the Lord. We're receiving over 10, 10 contacts from Bulgarian people that are seeking us every day. And as the coronavirus has affected Bulgaria, people have turned their hearts to the Lord. And Bulgaria has seen, you know, from our perspective, we've seen a huge significant um, impact in that. We're overwhelmed with the amount of people that are contacting us. And we're, you know, we're trying to stay organized and contact and we're receiving so many more people now. And it's kind of unique for us because it wasn't something that was happening four weeks ago. So it's really amazing to see the, the work of the Lord enhance and speed it and hasten during these very hard times. That sounds incredible. Wow. Thank you, elders. Um, and sisters, I know you didn't raise your hand, but do you want to do you want to add anything? I've got um, I'll, I'll unmute the Turkish sisters. Yeah, um, honestly, I just want to add to what Elder Pritchard said that we have seen a significant difference in the work here in Bulgaria, specifically the last month. And I think that goes against what all of us thought when we heard we were being quarantined. Um, you know, thoughts of frustration came in thinking, well, how are we going to do this? Um, we love being out there on the streets. Like President Davis said, he We've been hitting those streets, talking to those people, but the Lord has provided different ways for us to do the same exact work. And I mean, it's true, like <laughs> we've been quite overwhelmed. My family keeps asking, oh, what do you do all day? You know, are you just, how's work going? And it's, it's overwhelmingly great. Like the work here is just progressing so much and we're very busy and we're very happy. We have a couple of people on date who are just, amazing Bulgarians, always finding new potentials, so. That sounds incredible. Uh, President Davis, is there anything else you wanna add or is there um, anyone else you think we should hear from? Any, any questions? I can tell you a little bit about our um, Sunday services these days, which is obviously looks a little different than normal. Which, but I think it just tells the incredible story of what's going on. We, we um, just real briefly, we um, were instructed, you know, that obviously we weren't going to be able to meet together, and um, and so we, so what, what are we going to do? And and the area says, well, you know, the families are going to have to hold these meetings on on their own. And and uh, as soon as they said that, it, it took me a full split second to realize that uh, a vast majority of our members in both countries don't have the ability to, to really have that kind of a meeting in their home. And, um, and so we encourage the home-centered uh, sacrament meetings and, um, and families to, to spend time together and study Come Follow Me. But we offer a Sunday, what I'm calling a devotional on Sunday mornings in four different languages, four different meetings. And so this is, uh, 
Sister Davis and I have been on Zoom literally all day today attending all of these different Zoom meetings. But, um, but we started off pretty small. And, um, but uh, last week, uh, Krause can fill in maybe what's happening this week, but last week I think we had about 450 people join these four different meetings. 59 non-members joined. Once again, and then, you know, people that are seeking, they, we tell them about this Zoom devotional that we're having. They have an opportunity to see the church without actually going to the church in a safe way. They don't know what, you know, investigators sometimes feel nervous about coming to a strange church with strange people. And, and so they have an opportunity to, in a safe way, in an, an anonymous way, join our meetings and they can see a, a, a good, con a well-conducted meeting with instructional, inspirational talks in an organized way. And so I'm really hopeful that, that we see um, a lot of fruits come out of uh, those people that are joining these, these uh, devotionals. Thank you, President. We do have a, a, a couple questions. One was, what determines whether um, foreign missionaries are coming back to the US or not? And are the missionaries teaching English online? Yeah, those are two good questions. The, the first one, um, uh, we, as many of you have seen the announcement that all Americans are coming home, it kind of felt like all missionaries were coming home. And, and quite honestly, most of our missionaries felt the same thing. You know, how are we different? But, but, uh, but if you read, read further, it says, except in those areas where missionaries are needed to, to maintain and sustain the church type of thing. And so East Europe and Europe was determined that our, that our American missionaries would stay unless, unless certain COVID circumstances uh, forced them out of those countries. Some countries made us leave, uh, but Bulgaria has not done that. So, so we've, uh, we've decided to stay and our missionaries, without it, with every single one, are so glad that they're not go, going home, doing nothing, watching video games, and hanging out. So, Elder Cotton, Elder Cotton, we wish you were back here too. They I know. do. How they send you home? <laughs> but um, but any but anyway, there's thirty three thousand missionaries still out. The field yes. Right now. So we had sixty five. Uh, we still have thirty three thousand out. Most of those are in North America. There aren't that many around the world Americans that are still that are still serving, but we feel like we're once again unique and privileged to be here. What was the second question? Um, let me see. The second question was: Are the missionaries teaching English online? Well, that's another great benefit. We've been teaching, having English clubs. We call it in all of our whenever we have missionaries, we have we have we try to host an English club. But these smart missionaries, they figured out that we can, we can advertise this on Facebook and our website. And now we have three English club, clubs going on. Countrywide. Countrywide. So, so we, just, we do it all from Sophia. And so we have, a, I think is the way it works, a, a beginner, intermediate, and advanced English courses. And so um, our missionaries are doing that. So, yes, we still do that. I think they're starting it this week. Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure yet. Yeah. And then, wow. Okay, so we have a, a question from Ileana Clift to everyone. How can non-members join you for church? Do they, um, do they go to your websites? Is that, or um, online? Well, if they go to our website and, and contact us and we can send them the, uh, the link, uh, we can do that very easily. But I, I, uh, we just need to have some kind of contact information. So they can either give them to you or one of our missionaries. That would be awesome. Okay, no, that sounds good. Um, if somebody wants to type in their, their email address or contact information, we'd be more than happy to chat with them. Okay. And is there anything we as returned missionaries or uh, members across the world that have joined in, is there anything we can do to help the missionary effort in Bulgaria and, and worldwide? What, what would you recommend? Uh, how can we help? Well, I'll tell you, be, this afternoon as I was contemplating this meeting, that was the first thought that came to my mind, is to invite all those return missionaries to reach out to those people that you've taught, whether they're members or not, and, you know, inactive members, uh, 
uh, contacts or, or friends that you, you had that never joined the church, if you would reach out and contact them and, and, uh, and see if they can, would be willing to continue to chat and don't just give them, you know, give them a missionary's phone number, start chatting with them, uh, having a conversation with them. Remember me, what are you doing during, during what, are, what are you doing now that you're at home? Uh, you know, this is, and then somehow in a natural, normal way, start having a gospel conversation. And then, and then once again, you can hook up a three-way with the, with our missionaries here and we'd love to be able to meet them. Or have them invite them to the Zoom. And invite them to the Zoom or the English Club. There's so many different tools that, that we can do. So, but that's my invitation to all those that can hear me is to, and that are served here, that know people here, is to get to know them again rekindle that re those relationships. Elder Nguyen Saunders said that we should have all the return missionaries that have served in Bulgaria in groups come back over here and have reunions and have them go out and find all these people they baptized that weren't coming to church anymore and see if that made a difference. I think that's an awesome idea. Maybe you could plan a reunion in Bulgaria and go help us find all these folks that aren't coming anymore. I would certainly enjoy that. And I have names coming to my mind right now. I'm sure people listening already have names of uh, families that are coming to their mind. Um, oh, I guess somebody's asking about Ivan Jambov. Do we have any news about Ivan Jambov? Are we talking about Elder Jambov here? I think so. James, is that, James, uh, the question's from James Miller. Is that who we're talking about, Ivan Jumbo? He, sh he should be on the line. Elder Jumbo should, uh, one of those groups. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so we, I guess people are wondering uh, where he is. And they're, then, all, they're all in Sofia right now. Elder Jumbo is serving as his own leader. He is incredible missionary. Okay. And his family is a wonderful example to the Bulgarian people. They, they are you know, really awesome. We have Elder Hamer, that's, that's, uh, that's half Bulgarian, that's serving here. We have uh, Elder um, Mee Smith, that's full Bulgarian, serving here. And we have Elder John Bove that we've already talked about. He's also serving here as well. And there's a sister that was supposed to be coming, but she hasn't come yet, that's just been called, that's half Bulgarian. So all these people that left here, now their children are coming back to serve. So you can see the Lord has his eye on this place still. So Didi Kalarov did just the opposite. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Her kids Her will probably kids will come, come back, back to <laughs> grandma and grandpa one of these days. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, oh, we do have a question. Let me... President, her father makes up for this. Awesome. Um, uh, I'm Krasis, I don't know. <laughs> Can I see me um, call it off? Yes, uh, Michelle, I'm not sure if uh, Danielle saw my note about the way to go about checking on the apartment that you uh, want, that you asked. I was taught by your father's counselor at uh, an apartment. I was taught the discussions in 1991 in wow. September 1991 until December when I was baptized. And this was the first mission home. So yeah. I assume that this could be your dad's apartment, but I cannot remember the name of the brother that was his first counselor. Maybe if you can check in the uh, mission department archives to see who was his uh, counselor, then maybe you can get to the where he lived because each missionary apartment is registered. And then you can have this lead go back to check if this is your dad's apartment. Oh, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Yes, President Davis, um, what we're talking about is when, uh, when uh, the wall fell, Bulgaria started giving land and apartments and things back to uh, people that uh, they had been taken from during communism. And my grandfather donated his apartment to the church. And so we were just trying to figure out which apartment that was. So, I think we, we definitely need to put some effort in that and find it. Yeah, yeah, because I, I mean, I, it, it, belong, it belongs to the church now. That's, that's who he gave it to. So, well, it, it should belong to the church now. So, 
Well, do we have any other questions? I, I see some great side conversations going on in the chat. Um, one last question for me. Um, I want to know how we can get a hold of the Zoom recording because I know we've got at least three uh, Facebook pages of uh, returned Bulgarian missionaries that want to share uh, this evening with everybody. I have, I have no idea, but I, I know 26 missionaries that do, so Elder we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah, Elder Hatch is pretty tech savvy. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I think whoever, whoever um, the meeting is under, I, s since I pressed record, a recording will go to that email. And so I think, yeah, maybe Elder Hatch can be in contact with me, and then I can um, get that recording out to everybody, if that's all right. Well, I, I think we're, we're probably good, President, unless there's anything else you want to say. Make a YouTube channel, somebody's saying. I saw that, too. I don't know. Well, I don't, I don't have anything else. I think we've done way too much talking on our side. It was wonderful to hear this, this wonderful history. So thank you again for, for your time and your efforts. Oh, absolutely. Our pleasure. Our, our, our family has certainly uh, enjoyed this. I'll unmute my sister and my mom in case they um, have anything to add. But um, yeah, we're just, we're, we're grateful to have been a part of it. Thank you. And, and actually, I, I'll unmute mm -hmm. my sister because he served um, in Bulgaria. So yeah, if anyone has anything to, to add, to finish up, please go ahead, uh, Danielle. And, and You're wonderful, everyone. Christos vas crece and lekenos. vas crece. Thanks, everyone. It was great. Love you. Love you guys. Keep up the great work. Hurrah for Israel. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll see you in the summer sometime. That would be That'd awesome. Be great. Oh my goodness, that would be amazing. Well, the fairs are looking pretty cheap, so we'll keep our eyes on it. <laughs> well, now. well, I mean, we'll be in Utah. We'll, we live in Midway, so we'll we'll be there, and we'll have a fam we'll have a mission reunion in uh, in Midway this fall. Yeah. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Yes, let's let's keep posted on that. That, okay. that would be great. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you. Lekanosh, have, have a good night. Bye, Lekanosh. So good to see you guys. I'm unmuted. I can talk. Marius. <laughs> love you guys so much. I think I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Okay. So, we'll see you. Bye.